Well, let's get started. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome. And uh, today we have Dr. Justin Yonker from uh, here or CU. You. <laughs> You're joined uh, yeah, appointment. Uh, uh, Justin hold, uh, holds a bachelor degree uh, of science, a bachelor of science degree in physics and astronomy, and bachelor of uh, art degree in history and philosophy of science. Uh, someone was saying truth and beauty. <laughs> so I think Justin has both. <laughs> I'm about the beauty. <laughs> the art. <laughs> so, and both from the University of Pittsburgh and uh, uh, the town he grew up and also received his uh, PhD in physics at Virginia Tech, uh, working with Scott Bailey. Um, you see your degree last year, I guess, or earlier this year? Uh, two years ago. Two years ago. And maybe you worked on the AIM mission? <laughs> Just through Osmosis. Okay, and uh, and uh, uh, then he received uh, an NSF AGS postdoc research fellowship uh, to work here with Cor Rendell at CU and uh, also Stan Solomon here. Uh, his, his research focuses on odd nitrogen in the upper atmosphere, which is going to talk today. Great. Thanks, Anli, for inviting me. Uh, thanks, Stan, for having me. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I want to talk about how the NO in the thermosphere is made, how it's lost the chain from the initial absorption of the solar irradiance to the uh, creation <coughs> and destruction of the NO. Um, so w along with NO, uh, atomic nitrogen is left at the end of the ion chain. Um, what we can do is you can trace that chain back from the end products, the odd nitrogen, NO and N, back to the uh, energy deposition processes, photoelectron impact and photoabsorption. I don't know, there's a lot of steps in that chain, and I'm not going to, well, I'm going to try and steer clear of those steps, so flag me down at the end if you want. Um, when, what we want to do is explain the NO peak at around 110, well, between 100 and 110 kilometers. Uh, that was discovered by Barth in 1964, whose uh, unfortunate passing earlier this month. We'll uh, talk a little bit about his, the history he, and his contributions. His, well, we can't cover all of it. it he's, enorm he's a huge figure. Um, but the discovery 50 years ago this year, we'll talk briefly about that. Um, and I want to focus on the equator uh, below 140 kilometers, where NO is the dominant odd nitrogen species at all times. And um, at midday, which is where the snowy measurements were made at 11 a.m. local time, and um, compare model results from NOx-1D and TIGCM with the snowy measurements. And sure, there's still some work to be done. Uh, Okay, so I'm going to start in the troposphere and work my way up. So nitric oxide, if you Google it, you, you find the biologists have cornered the market on the molecule. Um, in 98, it was given the Nobel in medicine. What you, so apparently, if you put a lightning bug in a bath of NO, it just glows uncontrollably until it dies. I'm not condoning this experiment, but that's <laughs> what happens. And, so vascular dilation, it controls opening valves in the circulatory system. Um, so that's good, right? We wouldn't be able to breathe without it. Um, but the bad is that some of that air is polluted with nitrogen oxides. Uh, and you see the, this is the EPA standards on the, they've slowly been lowering the allowed amount of NO. Um, uh, right, so air will react with itself, the N2 and the O2, if you heat it up. And all these these big molecules, bigger than you know two diatomics, will typically be photolyzed with UVA or visible light. And it's very complex chemistry down here, but you can create smog, ground level ozone, stuff you don't want to be breathing in. Um, or you don't want drinking it either. Uh, so driving out here from Virginia, stopped in Burlington, right on 70, as soon as you get into Colorado. And we are, well, we have a nine month old at the time. Uh, we were, fortunately, wasn't six months old or younger, but so all over the city, we went into Denny's and the gas station, the hotel, 
no, these signs are posted on the windows around there. So apparently, nitrate, which is a by fertilizer, um, also a product of manure, uh, some is contaminated the wells. It's this was in April. The warning came out. It's was still there in July and still there in, in effect now. Um, when you read the uh, what, what happens is it bonds to the hemoglobin, changes it, and you can't absorb the oxygen, similar to CO. Um, but they don't know the source of this nitrate, so I don't want to blame the ag, ag community or anyone. Um, and <laughs> Presumably, there are people working on tracking down the source and fixing it, but don't drink the water in Burlington. You said fixing it, but you know, in, the, in, the, in the agricultural world, you're talking about nitrogen fixation, or right? Right. Fixation, right? <laughs> meaning, right. Meaning like taking it, and like legumes will do this. You know, take it out of sure, the air, sure. make it into something like ammonia that's available for plants. It always struck me that. Well, what we call odd nitrogen production is what farmers call nitrogen fixation. <laughs> it, it's interesting that you mentioned nitrogen or ammonia because uh, going back to the diesel slide, some of the trucking companies have used pig, pig urine in the ammonia in that to reduce the NO and convert it back to N2. So one of the new strategies for removing NOx from the exhaust is injection of Pig urine. <laughs> hey, got to do something with the pig pee. <laughs> um, stop eating pork, maybe. But there's a good side to everything if you find it, right? Uh, so, into the stratosphere. Um, so you, there's two main sources in the stratosphere. You can get N2O, which is also a byproduct of agricultural and bacterial the nitrogen cycle, and aircraft exhaust. Um, and you see this complex chain between NO and nitrite, NO2, converting back and forth between them through ozone loss and converted to HNO3, nitric acid, which is then depth deposited through the rain, just through acid rain. Um, so this is uh, destroys ozone. You can also get stratospheric NOx coming from above, uh, well, through the mesosphere and down into the upper stratosphere. Uh, as it's transported from the thermosphere. And this is a figure by Cora, uh, Cora Randall in 2009, showing uh, the winter t northern hemisphere and the descent of the NOx in response to the vortex breaking up. So the thinking is that the thermospheric NO, so you have a reservoir of NO, like a true thermodynamic reservoir of NO. It's always there. It, uh, destroys, uh, controls densities of other minor species. Um, when that descends, when the vortex breaks up, you can, you'll can you destroy ozone in the pole, which will affect the equator to pole temperature gradient, which will then, um, sorry, change the uh, waves, the zonal winds, and the gravity wave filtering. So it's a true global effect from this I know the problem is measuring it in the polar night is difficult. Uh, solar occult or stellar occultation is uh, the method for th this. This figure here is taken from Cora and Scott's uh, Explorer proposal, and the thinking is to use stellar occultation to measure it. And Scott's going to launch a rocket next year. Proof of concept for stellar occultation um, in the thermosphere proper, uh, you have your major species here, and above about 140, you get n quarter less. So this is it, sorry, midday um, equator, and below 140, NO is the primary odd nitrogen species. Above that, it's atomic nitrogen, n quarter less, ground state. Um, so the odd nitrogens few orders of magnitude larger than the ion, the ionosphere in the E region. Um, a couple of things to point out are that, uh, so NO is the only thing with a permanent dipole moment here, so it controls the temperature, radiates at 5.3 microns, uh, which is Saber's tune to measure. I'm not going to talk much about that, but there's some experts in the audience here. Um, also, I want to point out that 
right here near the peak, right? So this is why the NO comes down. Uh, well, one of the reasons why, because you have this peak here, right? This is an unstable situation. You shouldn't have a peak up there. It's going to diffuse downwards, but it's slow, typically. Um, but I want to talk about why there's, this peak is there in the first place. And also notice that at this peak, the O and the O2 densities are almost the same. So O to O2 is about equal to 1 at the peak. That'll also be important in explaining why the peak is here in the first place. OK, so this is the modern view of the thermosphere, right? And there's all kinds of transient minor species, the N2+, plus, N+, plus, O+, plus down here in the that are produced prolifically but lost even quicker, right? So they don't show up on this. Um, so going back to Barth's early, the early days, um, so they had the temperature right back in 61 when Barth was getting into this, right? Temperature, get a mesosphere somewhere between 80 and 100 kilometers and then this exponential increase. Um, what they didn't have right was the NO. So this is what they, when Barth launched his rocket in 64, this is what he thought he was going to measure. Um, and remember, we see there's actually a peak here, right at 110, but in this picture, the NO actually dies going down into the mesosphere. So you have actually a dip. And I, um, so what they were missing in this what before the discovery of it in 64, the big peak layer here, uh, the absence of it was they weren't considering the electronically excited atomic nitrogen, which reacts much faster than ground state atomic nitrogen, and um, is, is lost faster, and as we'll see, it's produced actually more prolifically. So it's 2 EV above the ground state, reacts with O2 to make NO, it's metastable, uh, radiative lifetime about a day, and it, it can also be quenched back to N-quartered S. And so the ground state actually is the main destroyer of NO and quartered S. So if NO is, can be thought of as the ther thermostat, uh, ground state N can be thought of as actually increasing the temperature. So producing N, you destroy NO, so you prevent the thermosphere from cooling. So the production of ground state N tends to increase the temperature of the thermosphere by preventing it from cooling. Um, it does contribute to NO production at high temperatures in the upper atmosphere above about 140 kilometers. But what you can see is that the, uh, uh, so here we have the altitude and the production rate at midday. In purple is the NWD production and the solid black is the N quartered S. Uh, so NWD is produced much more than N quartered S. And remember there's also this quenching of NWD can cascade to n quartered s. So when you subtract that contribution off, you're, you can you, what you're left with is the n quartered s production just from NASA sources is even factor two less than the n doublet d. So most of the atomic nitrogen in the thermosphere is produced in the excited states, and that is because of the NO plus recombination. So again, we'll see a few of these plots where we'll have altitude on the y-axis and production rate on the x-axis. And in the bottom, you'll have the lifetime or the inverse of the loss frequency on the x-axis. Um, what you want to see is that N double D is connected to the ion chemistry. NO plus recombines to produce it, whereas the main source of N quartered S is just the well, above about 120 is the quenching of N double D by collisions with O. And again, the lifetime here, you know, sub, you know, seconds throughout the thermosphere. So it's gone as soon as you make it. But the N quartered S lifetime, in, you know, five minutes down at 110 and about an hour throughout. So the reason N quartered S is, a, the density is much larger just because its lifetime is bigger, uh, lasts longer. So where does the NO plus come from? Um, and so all of the ions, all are well, N two plus, N plus, and O plus are all coupled to the background atmosphere. The O two chemically coupled to the reservoir, right? So they're lost as soon as they're made. Um, 
and they all lead to NO plus. So N2 plus, this is the main reaction leading to NO plus. It makes an N double D2. Uh, the N plus, uh, this isn't the main channel. The main uh, product is uh, O2 plus plus N. There's uh, debate about the electronic state of that N. But what you can see is that all of the ions lead to NO plus, right? And we're all familiar with this. This is the so-called most important reaction in the therm ionosphere because it converts O plus, which recombines so slowly because it only has one degree of freedom, into NO plus, which ha is a molecule and can vibrate and rotate and can get rid of electrons much faster than O plus. This is how you get rid of electrons in the EF region. Um, and this reaction is really sensitive to vibration level. Uh, several orders of magnitude when you increase the N2V. And if you look at the rates in Thai GCM, you might wonder what's going on. You look at this reaction rate, and it's really complicated looking. Um, and I believe that's to account for this N2 vibrational excitation. Um, and you also have charge exchange with NO leading to NO plus. But where the NWD comes from is NO plus recombination. Um, so where does the NO plus come from? Uh, again, production on top, lifetime on the bottom. Uh, so the N2 plus plus O reaction. Um, and you is the main source. And we can, so this is the second excited state of atomic nitrogen and there's you can see it's a source of NO plus here which again this is a disputed how significant and double P produces NO plus but we we don't need to get into that it's not included in many models it's just treated as N double D typically um, but uh, so the next step is to figure out where the N2 plus comes from but first I want to just step back and say where did uh, so Barth was missing the excited atomic nitrogen chemistry. They're also missing the x-rays. There was, Hinterrigger had measured the EUV spectrum from, three of, uh, from helium 30.4 longward in 60, but they really didn't know what the x-rays were like then. And this is from uh, Stan and Leading's paper in 2005. Um, and what you have, you see in the upper left, you have the solar flux, in the, on the bottom, um, orange and solar minimum, red and solar maximum, and the uh, cross sections for O2 and N2 up here. And you can see the energy deposited down at the peak is uh, predominantly, so around 110 kilometers, the only uh, irradiance that gets there is the short wavelength x-rays and uh, Lyman beta up to 100 kilometers, or nanometers. And this is log power. Uh, what we do in the model, um, or the model I'm going to be talking about, NOx1D, is we take the typical 37 bin uh, U UVAC, well, I guess it goes, it's older than UVAC. Uh, you break it up into 37 bins, and this is for low solar activity, and this is for high solar activity. You also have the Hinnerreger spectrum and the time C spectra. And what you can see is that with uh, during solar maximum, the most variable part is the x-rays down here. They increase several orders of magnitude. And, and that's going to be important for determining the solar cycle variability of the NO. Um, so why we care about the x-rays is just because of how much energy they carry. Um, right, so you absorb an x-ray. Um, and you're left, well, uh, you absorb just an 80 nanometer EV, so it's 15 EV, you get one N2 plus. As we said, N2 plus is gonna be the source of the NO plus and the NO, right? But you decrease the wavelength by a factor of 80 and you increase the potential N2 plus by a factor of 80. Um, so for each X-ray, right, you can make potentially 80 N2 plus or 160 NO, right, because N2 can be, two Ns can be converted to the two NOs. Um, now the N2 production itself, we, you can see that it's driven by the X-ray. So this is, these are glow photoelectrospectra in the upper left. 
Um, so you have the flux on the left and the energy on the x-axis. And uh, over you have a 150 kilometer spectrum here and a 110 kilometer spectrum down here. And the difference is uh, at about 100 kilometers, you can see the 150 kilometer spectrum dies out, whereas at 110, that uh, stays smooth, right? This dip here is due to the lack of x-rays. Um, you can evolve that with the cross-sections for photoelectroionization uh, in blue, photoelectron dissociation, and this is excitation, which I'm not going to talk about. The convolution of these gives the excitation and ionization and dissociation rates in each bin. And you can see that at 150 kilometers, the N2 plus is controlled by um, you know, 25 to 50, basically helium, yeah, the 304 line is what you see most prominently at 150 kilometers. Down at 110 kilometers, it's the x-rays at 100, producing photoelectrons at 100 eV that are dominating the photoelectron ionization rate of N2. So the x-rays are driving the N2 plus production rate down there. And as we'll see, the NO production rate also. Um, so what we can do is, uh, well, I took out the complicated slide and thought this was complicated enough. Um, the chemistry is really fast. Like subset, you saw the N double D last seconds. Um, all the ions last seconds also. So from the solar deposition of the irradiance, the NO is created really fast, really quickly, uh, and time scale of seconds. Um, and that's what's going to enable us to make this figure. So looking at the, on the top, you have production versus altitude production rate. And you can see that production from the chemical sources at midday is much larger than production due to vertical diffusion um, above 100 kilometers. And the same with the loss, right? You're, there's uh, diffusion from up high. Um, the chemistry, chemistry dominates at midday. There's so much, chemistry is faster than the diffu diffusive processes. So it provides a nice way of tuning your model, right? You don't have to worry about the transport. You can just focus on getting the chemistry right, getting the NO right at midday, whenever all this energy is being deposited and the chemistry is really active. Um, and you can see the N double D is the dominant production mechanism uh, with the N quartered S plus O2 coming in at higher altitudes. And below 100 kilometers, you're seeing transport from the, of the NO from the peak downwards into the mesosphere. Um, the loss below 100 kilometers is driven by photo dissociation. So the X rays. And the hard UV isn't able to get down below there, but the MUV, which only the NO will absorb, right, goes right through the N2, the O2, and the O, and gets down at the mesosphere and destroys it. So what you have, whenever the sun is shining, or energy is being deposited, you have NO being made, being transported down, can't get down there because it's being photo dissociated. So that's, again, part of the reason you have this peak here. Um, or the NO peak is because um, you have a bite out below 100 because the NO that's being transported down there is being destroyed, right? It's trying to fill in this hole, but it can't get there because the, every time the sun comes up, it destroys it. Um, and again, you can go through some really ugly chemistry and trace all of the production sources, you, well, you say, okay, well, how much does the NWD come from NO plus, for example? How much does the NO plus come from N2 plus? How much of the N2 plus comes from photo, photoelectron ionization? That's how you make this figure here. And you can see that photoelectron ionization of N2 is the dominant source of NO production. And similarly with the loss, you can see that photoelectron dissociation is the dominant destroyer of N direct dissociation. So an electron hits the N2, splits it up into two atoms. Uh, one N double D, one N quartered S typically. And again, below 100 kilometers, your, the dissociation is killing it and it's being produced by diffusion. Um, 
so uh, again, we're trying to. I'm trying to explain why there's an NO peak, and you saw that there, part of that is because it's being destroyed below 100 kilometers. So it's a false peak, and that it's just uh, just cutting stuff away. But there's also um, the N2 plus turns out to be most efficient at making NO at 110 kilometers, right? So this, so you start out with an N2 plus, and what happens? It's either going to react, it's going to react with an atomic oxygen atom 70% of the time, and a O2 molecule 30% of the time. This chain ends up producing NO, but you're going to make some N quartered S as well, and end up with D. So you're going to be left with you're going to destroy 0.52 NO and make 1.14 NO. So that's what this figure shows. This, uh, the dashed line here, is the number of NO destroyed per N2 plus, and the solid line is the number created. And the difference, of course, is the net yield per N2 plus. And you can see it peaks down at 110 kilometers. So uh, in addition to the N2 plus production rate and the NO production rate being maximized down here. Also the case that it's most efficiently made down at 110 kilometers. And you can see some of that in this figure. Um, so this is just chemistry. This uh, has nothing to do with the thermosphere. Um, I mean, well, it has everything to do with it, but the figure is made just on the rate coefficients and densities and, and a temperature. So we have a temperature on the left and the O2 to O ratio on the bottom. Um, now remember, you need O to make the N double D 90% of the time, but and you need the O2 uh, for the N double D to react with. But if you have too much O2, what's going to happen is the N2 plus is going to react with the O2 and lead to O2 plus, which then is going to remove an NO through charge exchange. So there's this balance between having the right number of O's and O2's. And as you might expect, the ideal number is one. Well, close to one. You need one O2 and one O. So O2 to O over one is going to give you the best, the most efficient production of NO from N2 plus. Um, so in the, in the thermosphere, you're, you're up here somewhere. Um, and you know, as you go down in the mesosphere, you, you end up over here. Um, you can see the contours get much thinner and thinner as you decrease uh, the O2 ratio. Whereas if you increase O2 to O, the contours pretty much stay the same. They get a little smaller at a given temperature, but not much. So what this shows is that although an O2 to O ratio of 1, as we saw, is the case near the peak in the earlier slide, is ideal for making the NO, O2 is more important. It, you, having a low O2 to O ratio or a high O to O2 ratio is, uh, uh, oh, sorry, having a high O to O2 ratio is less efficient. The, uh, the thermosphere is less efficient at creating NO from N2 plus, um, which means that at solar minimum, whenever O to O2 gets smaller, thermosphere is actually more efficient at making NO. So you can, another little factoid. So, okay, I think we've explained the peak. We have O to O2 is one, the N2 plus production is maximized, the efficiency is maximized there, and you have this bite out below 100. That's why you have an, a peak NO at 110 kilometers. So I want to actually look at the NO data and see if we re can recover it with the model for the rest of the time. Um, so, student nitric oxide explorer Snowy flew from 98 to 2003, and Stan was one of the main driving forces behind this with, with Barth. And its mission was to, well, part of its main scientific objectives, determine the X-ray, uh, measure the X-rays and the NO at the same time and connect the two. Um, uh, what it did was measure the resonance fluorescence off the molecule, uh, so it only could measure in the sun, and which this, this figure is kind of bad for that, because even though a lot of NO is being made, it's not really 
able to measure it in the night. But uh, it was a great mission, and it's the same way Barth discovered it in 64, measuring resonance fluorescence off the nano gamma bands. Um, unfortunately, it didn't settle the issue as far as the x-rays. It had an x-ray photometer on there, but uh, this is from Stan's AGU talk from a few years ago, and it shows the history of uh, what's called XUV fact. So this is a factor by which you multiply the standard reference EUV spectrum by to get um, to, to get what the actual x-rays are. And you can see it's varied considerably over the years. Snowy was up at 4 and UVAC is down here at around th 2 to 3 and looked like it was getting better and now it's back up and EVE SDO is hopefully going to is redu reduce the uncertainties, but again, there's problems with the resolution on Eve to getting the, uh, the the 0.1 nanometer resolution claim is not being fulfilled below seven nanometers. So there's a free parameter here. We want to look at um, right. So SDO wasn't up in 1998-99, which is when Snowy was. So we want to look at this period of time. To compare with the NO, um, okay, and sorry, you can see that the uh, X-rays. So this is standard UVAC. Uh, these are the ex photoelectron ionization of N2, dissociation, dissociative ionization, and excitation rates versus altitude Com for low solar activity and high solar activity. With the standard UVAC on the top and uh, with the snowy measurements on the, well, what you do is you modify the UVAC x-rays based on what snowy measured, um, increase them. And you can see that the, it's about 20% effect at 150 kilometers where little deposition occurs, but it's much larger, closer to, you know, 50% down at 110 kilometers where the x-rays are deposited. So there's a big uncertainty with the actual basic driver of the model. Um, but there's also uncertainties with the chemistry. And so these are the, the four principal uh, NO reactions. Um, N double with D plus O2, the quenching of N double with D, the cannibalistic reaction between the odd nitrogen and the temperature, very temperature sensitive ground state with O2 reaction. Um, the, the red are quantum chemical, mostly quantum chemical results, and the blue are um, recommendations uh, that have come out in the past 10 years. And the, the black solid lines are the, uh, the, what's in TIGCM 1.94. And you can see there's, a, so down at uh, room temperature, things look good, right? Just where the laboratory guys measure, you'd expect uh, the room temperature rates to be in agreement, and for the most part they are. But right as you go up in the thermosphere, you know, you increase the temperature, and you know, factors of three and four uncertainties in the rates. Uh, so, um, so here's there's, so these are basically kind of free parameters to play. I'm, but you, uh, you right, we can choose which one of these. We're turning the knobs, tuning the models. These are the main knobs you want to turn. Um, so the Knox 1D model, which I w was running at Virginia Tech, uh, what we do is we take EMSIS inputs and we take either a UVAC or a UVAC plus the snowy spectrum and we put out a photoelectron spectrum uh, from GLOW driven by one of those uh, irradiances. It solves the continuity equation for these 11 species, quasi-neutrality for the electrons, um, and every hour on the solar and the photoelectron spectrum, and has diffusion for NO and quarter less, um, PCE at 40 kilometers, and diffusive equilibrium at 250. What we want to do is, you sh by playing with the chemistry and the x-rays, you sh we've shown that we can recover the snowy NO. So this is four different altitudes for 1999 uh, NO density on the left and time or day of the year on the bottom 
and remember it was measuring at 11 a.m. The red is the uh, UVAC plus one chemistry and the blue is the snowy solar irradiance plus a different chemistry and you can see we're within 20 percent at all altitudes. Uh, you can see the 27 day variability of the solar rotation pretty clearly as you get under lower altitudes and when you look at an altitude versus time plots uh, same thing um, just so just sample days throughout the year comparing the two again we're within 20 percent on each day um, the neat factor about the altitude plot is you can see the slope changes at about 120 where the temperature really kicks up right so at about 120 kilometers the temperature starts going exponential and the, the slope in the NO changes because the N quarter S plus O2 reaction kicks in and changes the slope. Um, so the yearly average rate, we're looking pretty good with both sets. So which is the right chemistry? We don't know. Just the models yeah. Plot. Middle plot down here? Um, so the models are being driven by the, the Chin Eddy diffusion. Uh, so in the summer, you see the uh, KZZ gets really big and you see this double peak because the NO is being pulled down stronger. Um, you don't exactly see it in the data so much, but the snowy error bars below the peak get really big, so maybe it's there. It's not too much. I don't think you would even see it within the error bars if it was there. Um, is that what you're asking, Soros? Well, and I also noticed that the, the X's are just way off. Oh, so yeah, you know, you're never going to get every day right, mm -hmm. right? I was um, just wondering if there was a geophysical for this this figure right here. Mm -hmm. You're asking why the why the data is so much higher than the model? Yeah, um, he said we're looking at really want to make sure the model gets the whole year average within 20 percent. Any day you're going to be uh, right. There's uh, so these are zonally averaged to take away the tidal effect, uh, um, and uh, at 11 a.m. So, so when, when is that? I can't read these. So this is uh, 1999 day 214. So these are all just different days from 1999. Zonally averaged snowy with the zonally averaged NOx 1D results. What you want to see is that the yearly average over Right, we're really nailing it. The slope's right, the magnitude's right. And yeah, these are 10.7 and 10.7 A's for those days. These are these are MSIS-based. MSIS is driving the neutral densities, MSIS but and the temperature. KZZ is variable. Right, so we're using the... But that's not your affecting MSIS, it's only affecting the NO. Right. right. So if there were a composition effect driven by the KZZ that was different from what Emsis thought, say for instance, increasing the O2, mm -hmm. then that would drive up the, the actual NO. If you get more O2, you're going to get more NO. Right? right, right. So if you wanted to believe that KZZ was elevated in the northern hemisphere somewhere, that that had an effect on thermosphere composition. If that's what you're predisposed to believe, you might find support for that idea in your little panel. Um, yeah, I mean, you could look at, I don't, I mean, you should go back to MSIS and just look at it. Or any other thing changing the composition and its density. Yeah, that's a good idea. Definitely look at that. But this is driven by the NO just being pulled down through the, Enhanced steady diffusion. Yeah. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I can't read that. Huh. Right. Right. Hmm. But uh, yeah, these are all all good ideas. Um. So let me go to Taiji CM now, where we're not using a variable eddy diffusion. We're just using a constant eddy diffusion and compare that see how it's doing with the snowy data. So with the equator, um, again you see the 27 day variability there but it's pretty low. Um, it's 
doing, in general, it's doing much better at higher altitudes. Um, as you go up in altitude, the agreement gets better. And looking at similar plot, so this is at the equator for, again, just days sampled throughout the year, um, and the yearly mean down at the bottom. Uh, you, the slope isn't right. It's, it's, it's in agreement up top where the NO is in photochemical equilibrium. Um, but the reason it's getting the slope right at the top is because it's so big at the bottom. Right? It's just dying and just connecting with the top. Uh, so the thinking is we can you know, play with the chemistry and maybe improve this. But what we don't want to do is break the agreement at mid-latitude. So this is at minus 30. Um, and you can see, uh, so Dan has shown in his GNOME paper that the three main uh, orthogonal functions determining the NO are the uh, geophysical, or the geomagnetic drivers, the solar drivers, uh, and the uh, the, um, the basically the length of the day, the solar zenith angle. So that's what's giving you the, the U shaped here. In the summer, mid latitudes, the, the NO is getting lower, and then, I'm sorry, in the winter, the NO is getting lower because the solar zenith angle is lower or larger. Um, but, but it's doing pretty good, I think, Thai GCM at minus 30. I mean, it's getting the seasonality right, and you're seeing the, the geomagnetic the geo, geomagnetic KP driving. Uh, it's getting the events right pretty good, too. Um, and the same with, oops, sorry, uh, 30 north. Again, you see just the opposite effect, right? In the summer, solar zenith angle is small. You get more NO. Um, and, you know, in, see, again, you're getting the events right, and for climatology, it's it's not bad. Um, going up to even higher latitudes. Um, so I'm sorry. I should. The X's are the snowy data, and the black is the model. And this is for 1999. Um, similar trends. Uh, you see the the U shape again in the southern hemisphere, and tracking pretty well. Uh, but when you look at the northern hemisphere, and Wenbin pointed this out uh, first, you can see the uh, the data shows what is expected from Dan's known. I mean, what Dan showed is driving it. You see the U shape with uh, low at the summer, but uh, the model is getting the trend to com completely opposite down low. Um, and this is just for 1999, but we ran it for 1998 too. Similar effect. Um, something's going on. You just see the trend is off here. So just, there's been suggestions turning on the eddy, variable eddy diffusion. Maybe it had something to do with this. I'm curious to hear ideas from you. Um, I'm about to wrap it up. So overall, we just took the yearly map, uh, you know, the model, absolute model data error and plotted it. And again, you see this. Above 140, uh, so this white is actually this white, not this white right here. Sorry. Um, above 140, everything's looking pretty good within the 20% uncertainties, except in the northern hemisphere. You see this, something's going on with the northern hemisphere. I don't know why, we don't know why it's off. Um, between 110 and 140, though, generally, right, your 50% agreement, not bad uh, overall, but Below the 110 to a, below the NO peak, um, it's doing pretty bad. I mean, you're getting down to the lower boundary condition there, but there shouldn't be that much interference from the lower boundary condition, and there's not much flux coming upward. Um, so, fixing the lower latitudes, low sorry, lower altitudes is uh, on the agenda, and then doing it. What we really want to do is also make this, the same plot for WACAMAX. How is it doing around here? Um, do we see the same weirdness in the northern hemisphere? So uh, that's I'm going to summarize then. Um, so the conclusions. Uh, so the NO is there because of the ionization. The N2 plus, the chain from the N2 plus through the 
uh, transient species in between leads to NW, NO plus, NAAD, and NO. Um, we see this peak near 110 kilometers due to three main factors. The X-rays are deposited there and the N2 plus production rates maximized. Um, the, it's most efficiently converted to NO as well. Um, not only is the production rate high, but the efficiency is highest because the O to O2 is near one. And you see this photo dissociation below that. So any NO, NO transported down is destroyed. Um, the solar spectrum right, we're, keep getting better and better and better, but there's still some uncertainties with the x-rays, and there's even more uncertainties with the chemistry. The chemistry has been kind of ignored in light of improving the solar spectrum um, in the field. Uh, also, so the TIGCM NO was within doing really good above 140 kilometers and acceptable between 110 and 140 kilometers except, you know, bigger difference in the northern hemisphere and too high below 110 kilometers, even though the seasonality is good uh, and in agreement with what's expected from the Marsh paper and NOAA model, uh, except at the high latitudes in the northern hemisphere. So I, that's, that's it. Um, thanks for coming. And there's lots more to come in the future. Thank you. Yeah, there's, uh, so first thing is we'd also expect to see it in the southern hemisphere, right? You showed not only is there transport out of the auroral zone in the northern hemisphere, but out of this, the auroral zone in the southern hemisphere also. So what would explain that, I mean, that could explain the northern hemisphere, but it would also open the question as to why we're doing good in the southern hemisphere. Um, also, that paper, uh, Scott's and uh, the Bailey and Barth 2004 paper, they really only showed it's happening at 110 kilometers. Their model, they didn't have the higher altitude. So my dissertation work was getting the higher alt altitudes working. So they showed that there's this, right, so what they did is they, they showed their model was working good at 110 kilometers. They subtracted the uh, x-ray produced NO off of the snowy. So it was good at the equator where the x-rays were driving it. They subtracted they assumed it's good everywhere, assumed, subtracted that, and seen the transport. I mean, it's kind of a, uh, it's difficult to say you're seeing transport. There's just a lot of uncertainties. Like I said, they're not, they weren't sure they were, there's lots of reasons they could have it right. Did they have the chemistry right? They didn't, they weren't sure that, they didn't have the model right, or the model data right at the higher altitudes, um, where, right, 2009 Barth kind of, came along and said, well, maybe it's not the NO being transported, it's the, the heat being transported, which is making the NO, and then it's falling down from higher, from the higher latitudes. Um, which, which discrepancy are you talking about? IGCM or Why don't you go back a slide to show, to show that chronological degree? Okay, so you see that stuff at the bottom at 100 kilometers? This is, this is some kind of, this is likely some kind of tidal thing going on because, because clearly the tide GCM is not going to do a good job of tide being well down to the end. There's tidal features are very salient below latitude by the snowy data uh, once you get down to 100 kilometers. So I, I, I think that's. Uh, that's pretty uh, 
that's pretty, that's kind of expected that you would see that. But this thing at 125 kilometers with that big, that big uh, northern hemisphere problem, I don't know. Yeah. yeah it's it's transported in the models. I mean, we've already known that the models can't face at a very, very strong wind shears. That seems to be an area where the model does okay. Has there anyone looked at, uh, say, time GCM uh, result in you no know, similar, mm -hmm. similar way? Actually, uh, I was thinking of the um, discrepancy you mentioned earlier in the northern hemisphere. I thought maybe I got the sign wrong. I thought the U shape was for U shape was for winter time, and uh, and if anything, it seems that it's the the observation was kind of abnormal, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but it's what it is. <laughs> I, I, I know, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> the theorist abnormal, speaking. It's yeah, not, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not like a, the model. Was Nitric oxide in the northern hemisphere polar region in the summer. Uh -huh. In the in, you know, summer, right? The middle of the year, the yes. northern hemisphere summer. It wants to put a bunch of nitric oxide there at the lower altitude. And you don't see that in the southern hemisphere either. Mm -hmm. go, go back, show the southern hemisphere, see? Southern hemisphere. Yeah. It sort of wants to do the same thing, but the data. Aren't 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 uh, aren't terribly upset about that, except for maybe <laughs> around 355. So, so there's, oh my God, there must be some sort of hemispherical difference in the thermosphere. And also, how do they treat the lower boundary condition in time GCM of or NO2? Does it assume hmm. equilibrium, some kind of equilibrium, or? Yeah, I, I, that, that's a good question. I, 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 uh, anyone? Uh, <laughs> Is there like a false accumulation, or could there be a possibility of that? Because it's so big. Well, no, it is 107, right? This is a couple scale heights above the lower boundary. The lower boundary condition uh, for NO with minor species solver. Uh, Probably some chemical equilibrium. Yeah. Chemical equilibrium okay. condition at 97 kilometers. Right. I don't think that's going to change much. This is all, uh, this is mostly fast chemistry daytime stuff. Of course, there's, there's a transport term in there, uh, but I don't think that's driving the bus. The composition is driving the bus. Yeah. Look at um, yeah, the the lack of mm -hmm. Right, thanks, Tom. And then the that, so Right. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Thank you again, Justin. Thank you. Thanks.